Our final segment concerns the slow return of passengers to public transportation in what we hope is the wake of COVID-19. Print and broadcast media have reported nationwide declines in ridership in comparison to 2019, the last full year before the pandemic caused closures of businesses, schools, and other services. Many have speculated on the cause of the decline in public transportation ridership. For a sociological perspective on this developing phenomenon, I spoke with the University of Houston professor Catherine Freeman Anderson. Professor Anderson, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So these reports are indicating that a lot of metropolitan transit systems in the United States are having trouble getting passengers to return. Just to get us oriented first, what are the kinds of transit systems in metropolitan areas? You know, you know, what's the mix? Just in general, what are the kinds of possibilities and how do they differ from one another? Um, and, you know, just to get us grounded. Um, so depending on the size of the region, there might be various kinds of, um, I'm assuming you're we're talking about public transportation only. Um, so there's typically a mix of um, uh, rail, so either heavy rail or light rail, um, and then also bus transportation. And then some locations have um, different sorts of um, at grade other kinds of transportation like uh, street cars or even um, buses that are um, kind of set aside like street cars that have dedicated lanes or dedicated routes, but typically those are at the same um, grade or at the same level as you would see cars and are sometimes subject to the same traffic that cars would be subject to. Um, but we typically observe different kinds of ridership of the different sorts of transit that are available in regions. Um, not all regions have all of them. Uh, bus is more common than um, any kind of rail, um, mostly because it's easier to put buses on the ground and it doesn't require uh, built infrastructure to keep them going in the same way that rail does. Um, but bus ridership tends to be um, of lower socioeconomic status in large part because the, um, the ridership, or sorry, to, to ride is cheaper generally than what we see with rail and rail ridership, um, not everywhere, but generally, um, we find that um, that fares to use rail are um, more expensive and, and oftentimes are, you know, uh, when transit systems are targeting ridership, they're, they're um, kind of placed um, in more affluent areas and things like that and have um, a, a typically a higher SES clientele. But of course, all of this depends on the, the goals of, of the region. So different uh, regional transit authorities or, or metropolitan transit authorities may organize um, these different systems differently. But th that's kind of the, the broad patterns that we observe. Do, uh, and I imagine, you know, once a, once a um, well, first, let me ask, heavy rail and light rail. I've heard this before. <laughs> I don't <laughs> There's probably some technical or analytic distinction. What's the, can you clarify that a bit? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know if I remember, yeah, I don't know if I remember the technical specifications for what specifies heavy versus light rail. Um, but heavy rail is what you think of as being a, a, a train, but that carries people, whereas light rail, um, the, it's, it's the grade of the, um, of the rail and what and kind of the capacity that it can take um and so there i'm sure there's i don't know exactly what the, <laughs> i don't know exactly what the specification is but it's essentially it's what it sounds like so the um you know trains can typically you know have a, a much larger number of cars and things like that because um it's actually using set aside rail heavy rail lines that have a wider gauge um in a, in a kind of a similar lines that what you can see um even like freight trains riding on and things like that whereas light rail is not it has a, a smaller gauge um smaller lighter um cars and they may or may not be at a grade level with the street i see so so then my other question was what uh, well, given what you had just said about the socioeconomic differences between uh average level of bus ridership versus rail ridership. I would imagine that once the rail system gets built, it may get built in a particular, you know, with a direction 
uh, and it may pass various neighborhoods of varying socioeconomic statuses and have stops in those. But at some point, gentrification might occur that it just uh, crowds out. But maybe that's not uh, part of the that's part of the process. I mean, I can imagine also people might uh, the designers might sort of have a zigzag through neighborhoods to get uh, the ridership that they're seeking. But I mean, is there any, there may not be any evidence on which is, which what happened, whether one thing happens it, or the other or. Yeah, it's, it's both actually. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, the, the biggest distinction between rail and bus is that rail lines are fixed. Um, obviously you can build more rail, li rail lines or go in different directions, um, but it's, it's, you know, a much longer term planning process to put in a rail line and they don't typically move them for um, for quick reasons, right? Um, you, you might have an overhaul of a transportation system overall, but typically what's, what happens is you see add, you know, lines added on, not taken away or moved um, because it's so difficult. And especially if you're talking about um, anything that's uh, below ground. Um, so, you know, obviously those, those are much more expensive to build and are, are typically fixed, um, but we observe both. So we find that um, lines on average are put through more um, affluent areas to begin with. Um, but then we also find that once a rail line is planned for an area, we see um, rents and housing values go up in those areas. Um, some of that depends on the region. So in areas where public transportation is considered to be more desirable, we see a, a higher premium in those areas for you know putting in an ex putting in a rail line. Um, but because rail lines are typically more efficient, especially if it's light rail that's not at grade, heavy rail, or um, subway systems that you know are not you know mixed with street traffic at all, that they're they typically are more efficient and they typically run um, more frequently than what we see with bus lines. Obviously, you can run bus lines as, as often as you want to, <laughs> in addition to, um, you know, subway lines or light rail lines. But we, um, but uh, typically, they run fairly frequently and are fairly efficient, especially if they don't mix with traffic at all. So for that reason, there's kind of a premium placed on rail lines. Um, and they're fairly expensive to build because it requires so much upfront infrastructure. But we observe both things at play. So it's not just one or the other. So we observe kind of a differential allocation of those resources in the first place. And then also um, some studies have shown that, you know, once, once a rail line is announced or is placed or there's kind of a, a perceived benefit of it, we see um, housing values go up in those areas and, you know, development around it. So that's um, in, well. That's an important um, con context for thinking about what the, is now being reported. That, as I indicated, passenger traffic has not returned to pre-pandemic levels in a lot of metropolitan transit systems in the U.S. The Wall Street Journal reported just recently that ridership in the five largest systems ranged between 25 percent and 55 percent of pre-pandemic levels. So I pulled down some data that they referenced and I looked at the overall story and it said that ridership is 32% of pre-pandemic levels for light rail. At the time I said, was thinking about what is light rail, but now I have a better sense. 45% uh, of pre-pandemic levels for bus and 18% of pre-pandemic pre levels for commuter rail. And that's taking in all the systems. I was looking at the first quarter of the 2021 compared to the first quarter of 2029, I mean, excuse me, 2019, <laughs> not the future. Um, so, so these appear to be large short shortfalls. Uh, any sense about what might underlie these kinds of patterns, this, this, this shortfall? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the, the main reason why people aren't using public transportation is fairly obvious, right? People are afraid to be around other people and they don't want to get sick. Um, and that's, that's a fairly well-known, um, pattern in the literature. So not just pandemic, I mean, sorry, not just the COVID-19 pandemic, but um, that people are more susceptible to infectious disease on um, in, when they use public transportation for fairly obvious reasons, right? <laughs> that if you are exposed to other people, you are more likely to get infectious diseases. Um, so I think that's, you know, the, the obvious underlying reason of, of people being nervous about writing. Um, 
But then also the, the other part of it is that people just aren't moving around as much as they used to. Um, so if we look at more, um, mobility patterns of both public transportation riders as well as um, you know pre-pandemic uh, car users, that people just aren't moving as much as they used to. So a lot of people's work arrangements have been kind of fundamentally rearranged such that they are uh, much more likely to work from home or at least partially like, you know, you know, their part of their work schedule may still be from home even now. Um, that has changed somewhat throughout the duration of the pandemic. Um, obviously, when a lot of places were under strict lockdowns and, you know, a bunch of businesses were actually closed or there was prohibitions on people being able to physically go into work unless they were an essential worker. Um, you know, so so the, that has changed quite a bit over the pandemic. But even even now, we still observe that um, people aren't working in the office nearly as much as they used to. Um, some people have gone permanently remote. Um, and then the other part of it is that um, people have also changed their lifestyles quite a bit. So when the pandemic hit, um, we saw people moving out into the suburbs in a way that they uh, may not have wanted to before because um, if they had to be in the CBD at eight o'clock every morning, why would you want to live out in the suburbs? But if you no longer have that constraint or if you changed your work, we know a lot of people shifted jobs in the pandemic too. And so people are just doing things in a fundamentally different way than they used to in terms of um, their travel patterns and work arrangements. And I think um, we just haven't seen, uh, especially among those more professional workers or people who have the ability to work at home, we just haven't seen them bounce back. Um, I will say, though, that essential workers um, have only changed their ridership patterns slightly. Um, so there's been some reporting on the um, mobility and movement patterns and, and public transportation use among essential workers and areas that have large numbers of essential workers. And those patterns haven't changed nearly as much as what we've observed in um, more affluent areas or areas with a higher number of um, professional workers who have the ability to work from home. So this, this issue of uh, this changing mobility patterns, people basically being less mobile, is that driven uh, as best we know? Or if not, what do we, you know, What's, what's the best indication or best sense we have? Is that being driven by purely the commuting change, change or is it also people are doing less uh, trip, fewer trips that would necessitate uh, public transportation because they're just going less, they're using it less on, on off commute times, like, you know, I don't know, going to the theater, going to movies, going to park, whatever people, you know, do shopping, because it's not just, you know, it's there permanently. It's not only necessarily going to run uh, in the on the weekend, yeah. or is it being the, driven just by the commute change? Um, so I think the the biggest change is commuting. Um, I mean, most people for most people's daily transportation needs do revolve around work, not other things. Um, although there are some differences across groups in terms of, um, I mean, pre pandemic anyway, <laughs> of how people behaved in terms of their travel patterns. Um, but I, you know, I think, I think that part of the story has also changed quite a bit over the pandemic as well, because, you know, early on, if you think like spring 2020, when virtually nothing was even open, um, there was nothing to even go to, right? <laughs> so yeah, you weren't going to the theater on Friday because there was no open theater, right? Um, and so I think for a lot of those, um, more recreational or even, um, shopping needs and things like that, people have changed their habits. Um, some needs like the grocery store, people are still more likely to do in person than other things. But we, you know, we saw a shift to online shopping. Many, many stores were closed for a long time, um, especially depending on where you live. Um, I'm in Texas, things weren't closed for that long. <laughs> but um, but I, I still think that, you know, people were, um, you know, or at least I did, I know, but, you know, made different decisions about how I traveled um, and how necessary it was to go to certain places, um, you know, based on the pandemic, you know, even after things weren't closed anymore. So I, I you know, I think it's a, 
kind of a rethinking of, of priorities, whereas you, you know, you may use transit to go to work because work is necessary. You may be less likely to use transit to, for entertainment purposes um, because it's not necessary. and You don't need to go out for those things um, aside from all of the closures that we observe too. So um, if ridership doesn't bounce back and I, a, a lot of this is um, when you talk about the, um, commute changes, actually, this is prior to this, so like, let me ask this question first. If we think about these commute changes, is this fundamentally about CBD, the Central Business District, downtown, white collar workers and big high rises and office space, but if you go further out, which is primarily, which is at least the places I know, I mean, uh, the public transportation system is, is designed to bring people there and get them, get them back out. But if you go to other areas of a city or a region, more decentralized parts is, are we still, I mean, I know I'm, you, there may not be evidence yet or data yet on this, but the best we know, are, is we, are we seeing similar patterns there? Are people not, um, you know, a reluctance or resistance to going into the office or ch changing this uh, um, uh, five day work pattern to something less uh, with at the most fewer days and maybe not at all? Yeah, I mean, so there's kind of two parts to what you're asking is like, is work fundamentally changed such that people have kind of permanently changed or rethought their schedules? And I think we are seeing some of that um, where people are just, and, and companies have allowed this because it actually has brought up, you know, flexibility and productivity and things like that. Um, Weirdly, everyone working from home didn't uh, make productivity dip. Um, you know, I read a study a little while ago that said, you know, people are taking more meetings than they ever were because they can do it on Zoom and it's, it's pretty easy to facilitate. Um, so I, I think some of this change is permanent in terms of a restructuring of how work is done in the United States. Um, but I think the kind of first part of your question gets at a broader debate that has been happening in you know, public transportation thinking for a long time is, is whether or not you focus your transit system on taking people from the outsides into the CBD and back at the end of the day, or whether or not the transportation system is really about circulating of people in a much smaller area, right? Um, you know, whether or not you can efficiently move people around a much smaller area, but do so in a way that um, kind of shortens travel times or allows people to move fairly freely and efficiently throughout even, you know, a fairly small area, as opposed to thinking about taking people from the suburbs in. Um, and I think that's the thing that maybe will, I, I think, I think that's the part of the debate that's going to change post pandemic. Um, because I think it's largely the bringing people from the outside in that has changed. Um, post pandemic times um, that, you know, those folks use it as a way to commute to work as opposed to a way to live life and get around um, and not be dependent on vehicles. So what we know is that people who live in, you know, closer into cities um, and who are of lower socioeconomic status are more likely to need that daily getting around the city kind of transit as opposed to that coming from the outside into the CBD kind of transit um, that is largely revolved around work and is really kind of almost suburban or at least outer city centric. Um, and so I, I think that's what transit agencies are probably going to <laughs> be grappling with in the years to come is that they have built a, you know, whole systems around this idea of bringing people from the outside in um, but those are the people who dropped off uh, first, right? Um, or or, or your, the statistics that you had at the, at the beginning of, you know, which type of transit was more likely to drop off or which had the, you know, more precipitous decline in use is it's that rail coming from the outside in um, because those folks were the ones who were able to quickly maneuver online and, and do their work from home. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that's coming back in full force anytime too soon. So... <laughs> well, if it if it doesn't come back, um, are the current systems as they're currently uh, designed? And I even know if it, in San Francisco, planned expansions of 
the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, which is uh, the subway system. Are these sustainable with fewer riders? And if you have the magic <laughs> answer for you, yes, and here's uh, how, how would that be sustained or what, what's the response that's going to have to happen? Yes, yeah, so it's it's not sustainable. Um, I think most have gotten by in the pandemic just because of provisions in you know the CARES Act and things like that that have allocated funding toward these systems that were really hurting in the pandemic. Um, but I don't know if that's going to be enough going forward. Um, it'll be interesting to see with the infrastructure bill how that might change some of this. Um, but I think transit agencies are going to and, and some of them are. I mean, I've read news stories or, you know, agency reports of, of uh, you know, like Houston, for example, is doing this, of kind of rethinking, um, you know, how they're organizing their transit and where their transit goes and what it looks like. Um, and actually spending a little bit more time on the bus infrastructure as opposed to rail, um, because because bus lines are so nimble, right, that um, and actually, this is what most of them did in, in response to the pandemic is that they um, kind of rethought bus lines and, and ways to move people around in a way that um, made that inner city circulator more efficient as opposed to thinking about bringing people from the outside and in. Um, and, th and this has been a debate for a long time in, in public transportation folks. It's kind of where you where you put your money. You know, do you is it a hub and spoke system where you you focus on the burbs? you know, oriented toward the CB, uh, CBD or whether or not you focus on um, circulating people. And I think we've, we've seen some already start to do that or kind of rethink, you know, how they would do that. The BART system in, in San Francisco is a great example of this. It takes you twice as long to get from the one side of the peninsula to the other side of the peninsula as it does to take you know, to get from Oakland to the peninsula, right? Um, and it's because it's, it's oriented towards these lines that go out in different directions and are able to pull people into the CBD. But it's, it's not a great system if you're already on the peninsula and you want to maneuver efficiently around the, the peninsula, that it relies on a lot of at-grade in-traffic streetcars or buses, um, and they run, you know, 20, 30 minutes apart and things like that, that it's just not designed to, to circulate people efficiently. And so I think if transit systems are going to be sustainable um, without government intervention, like they got in the in, you know, federal government intervention that they got in the pandemic, that I think places are going to have to rethink how they do their ridership and who their riders are. Um, as opposed to thinking about how to move people from the burbs in. Um, but I mean, who knows, with gas at, you know, four, four dollars plus a gallon, maybe everyone will be back on the bus. 528 in San Francisco these days. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that's a short, I hope, possibly that's a short term uh, shock. But the long term trend is as you're, is, you would say that it's as you're saying that it's they're going to have to rethink their systems. I think so. And some, I mean, some already are. So I, I think that's, um, and, and it wasn't just the pandemic. Um, I think the last few years have brought questions of, of equity to the fore as well. So I, I think this tension in public transportation and among urban planners of like, who are you designing this for and who does this benefit? Um, you know, these are not new questions, but I think with a lot of the kind of social turmoil of the last few years um, and more attention to kind of thinking about equity and, and thinking about how to do, um, you know, as a, as a public good, right? This isn't provided by the private sector. These are, these are public goods and, and who should it benefit and why and under what circumstances. I think some of that has come to the fore more in the last few years too, is not just thinking about um, what's the kind of best way to do this from an efficiency or an urban planning perspective, but also thinking about who does this benefit and what are the kind of implications or social implications of that when thinking about um, equity and workers and, and who this does and needs to benefit. Well, Professor Anderson, these are... Uh transformative times and this is a <laughs> potentially and this is a, certainly this uh, the pandemic has thrown a lot of things up in the air even uh, something as as uh, um, already in place as, a, as rail systems so uh, I want to thank you for helping us 
um, with your insights on how to think about this and what kinds of issues are in play. Um, and I appreciate your coming on and sharing it with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. That's this week in Sociological Perspective. We'll be back next week with another interview with an author of some important sociological research and more sociological insights on an issue in the news. Till then, take care. This Week in Sociological Perspective is produced and directed by Samuel Roundfield Lucas. Ocean Reflections theme by La Vigica and Musical Intermezzo by White Wolf, both at www.ccmixter.org. Video recorded interviews via Zoom. Transcriptions by Rev.com. This has been an Agency Structure Productions presentation.